This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good evening. It's great to have such a nice crowd here on a, on a beautiful day here in Berkeley. Uh, my name is Henry Brady, and I am the Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. Uh, it's great pleasure that I welcome you here tonight for an opportunity to hear from an international figure uh, with a unique perspective and a compelling, really fascinating, compelling, interesting history, uh, Dato Seri Anwar Ibrahim. He was Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia from 1993 to 1998. For the prior seven years, he served as Minister of Finance. Uh, his stance against corruption and his management of the Malaysian economy during its financial crisis won him widespread respect. He's considered a forefather of the Asian re Renaissance and a proponent of cooperation among civilizations. He's an ardent supporter of democracy and an authoritative voice bridging the widening gap between East and West. In 1982, he joined the United Malays National Organization and quickly rose in the party. In 1989, he was elected president of the UNESCO World Council, and he was also chairman of the Development Committee of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund in 1998. Anwar was unrelenting in his campaign against corruption and has been committed to the ideals of empowerment, justice, and equity. When Anwar amplified his calls for reform in 1998, then Prime Minister Mahathir dismissed him from the government and had him tried on trumped up charges. His trial and conviction were condemned by Amnesty International and other groups and many world leaders, including US Vice President Al Gore. And Anwar was telling me how important that was uh, during the subsequent period when he was incarcerated, that he had Al Gore's support. Six years later, the Malaysian Supreme Court overturned his conviction and Anwar was finally released from solitary confinement and prison in 2004. Since 2004, he has held lecturing positions at Oxford University, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. In March 2006, he was named honorary president of the London-based think tank Accountability. Last year, Anwar forged a solid political coalition and was able to recapture his parliamentary seat. As a result of that, he was able to assume the leadership of the opposition in the Malaysian parliament. This is a man who has had extraordinary impact on his country and on the world through the example of someone who fought and continues to fight corruption and tries very hard to bring different groups, ethnic groups, and civilizations together. He's today the leader of the People's Justice Party, an apt name of Malaysia, and of Malaysia's, as I said, parliamentary opposition. With that, I'd like to welcome him here, and I look forward to hearing your comments tonight. Anwar Ibrahim. As they say in Malaysia, terima kasih, which means thank you, Dean Henry Brandon, ladies and gentlemen, professors and friends. Um, this, is a, this is a premier university. I was trained essentially in Malaysia in a village university. So it is a rare honor to be given this uh, rare privilege. And thank you, Dean and uh, colleagues and for that uh, wonderful welcoming remarks. I should use that text and distribute to my constituents. <laughs> now, um, the discourse on Islam and democracy is cluttered with a host of misconceptions and prejudice that have given many reasons to conclude 
that there is no compatibility therein. They say that while democracy liberates men from the bondage of tyranny, Islam promotes autocracy and dictatorship. Liberal values emanating from the tradition of John Locke are starkly contrasted with Islam's penchant for totalitarianism and the deprivation of individual rights. Heaped on top of these assumptions is the post-9-11 rhetoric on Islam as a source of violence and the root cause of terrorism. In this regard, the rising tide of Islamophobia has made it difficult for moderate voices on both sides to engage in a discussion about Islam and democracy. Moreover, moreover, recent history offers sundry examples of instances where Muslim people were in fact quite at ease with democracy and spilled blood to advance the cause of freedom and justice in, these, in their own countries. Consider Iran in 1953 when Mohammad Mossadegh, the democratically elected leader of his people, were unceremoniously deposed in a coup orchestrated by the United States and petroleum companies. Iraq, too, saw its fragile democracy in the post-colonial period toppled, not by the religious extremists, but rather by a secular regime that would prove to be one of the most brutal in Arab history. Indonesia demonstrated an early commitment to democracy in 1955 with over 38 million people participating in a nationwide contest of diverse parties. I must also mention the experience of Pakistan, which was forged in the crucible of ethnic strife, but whose founding fathers expressed a clear commitment to a democratic process. Muhammad Ali Jinnah said in his constituency address in 1947, quote, the first duty of a government is to maintain law and order so that life, property, and religious beliefs of its subjects are fully protected by the state. Therefore, I don't suppose that I'm going out on a limb in saying that the fundamental principles of democracy are alive and well in the Muslim tradition. You might be surprised to hear that freedom is in fact one of the underlying themes of Islamic law, or what is termed as the Sharia. Islam has always been defined by its commitment to justice, adl, which entails consultation in governance and the abhorrence of tyranny and despotism. These ideals are encapsulated in the higher objectives of the Sharia, termed the maqasid of the Sharia, a concept articulated by the 8th century jurist Ash-Shatribi in Mawafaqat. Whereas Islamic law is today almost exclusively, exclusively understood in the light of specific rulings and regulations, and of course this famous decision by the Malaysian Sharia court to cane a young woman for drinking beer in public. This has been the unfortunate uh, portrayal of uh, what Sharia is not to be. So Ashatibi explained that the real substance of the law are its higher objectives, known as the maqasid, that seek to implement in society the preservation of religion, life, intellect, family, and wealth. I reiterate, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, sanctity of life and property, and the protection of human dignity, men and women. Without that, there is no Sharia. Mind you, these bear striking resemblance to the Lockean ideals that will be expounded centuries later and gradually filter into the formulation of the American Constitution. To the extent that democracy also includes the seeds of pluralism and the sanctity of life and property, and by extension, the appreciation for the rule of law, I can confidently say that Southeast Asia is a region whose experience with Islam and with democracy 
is remarkable. Islam's entry into the region was largely peaceful, gradual, and very much in sync with the traditions of the people it encountered. Arab traders and Sufi masters were the bearers of the religion, of religion that through largely peaceful interactions with existing Hindu, Buddhist, and animistic tribes and communities. As the religion spread organically, there was never an expression of rigidity and exclusivism that sought to homogenize society or root out elements deemed un-Islamic. This is essentially a modernist outlook with a penchant for pluralism and the ability to absorb the tremendous diversity found in the Asian continent. Now, the peaceful transition to democracy in Indonesia is one of the most important historical developments of our time. After three decades of brutal military dictatorship, Indonesians organized themselves into various political parties, some, of course, with a radical agenda, including the establishment of the Islamic State. But when the nation went to the polls, they, re they rejected the radicals. Having lost in the elections, they tried to push the agenda through other avenues provided by the newfound democracy. Again, this was over overwhelmingly rejected by the people. The results of the most recent election in Indonesia a few months ago demonstrate the foundations laid a decade ago are bearing fruit as a vibrant multi-party system, or multi-party in, in, in American slang. I use, I use enhance, and you use enhance. <laughs> Able to survive successive electoral contests without violence or instability. The press in, in, in Indonesia remains free and the fairness of elections is so far unsurpassed. People are free to associate with whom they wish, and public demonstrations are permitted without interference from the powers that be. I'm referring to Indonesia, not Malaysia. <laughs> While I'm a real, and, and I, an idealist at heart, I'm quite familiar with the reality of the situation in most other parts of the Muslim world. The contradictions are glaring. Autocrats and despots tell the world that if they democratize, the reform process will be hijacked by the radicals and extremists. At the very least, they argue that rule by iron fist is essential for economic growth. This is a familiar theory. I'm sure you've heard the recent speeches at the United Nations. The tragedy is that this fear continues to haunt the powers that be, crippling their foreign policy in, and, in some cases, their own domestic policies. Fear of fundamentalists and radicals emboldens leaders to impose harsher methods of dealing with terrorism. Fear of liberalization and globalization leads to inefficiency and lagging competitiveness. The upshot is that certain fundamental safeguards against abuse of human rights are allowed to be disregarded. The, this process of delaying or eroding freedom and democracy will in turn help to spawn more terrorists. I believe that given freedom and democracy, Muslim societies will know how to deal with the radicals and extremists. Again, the, again, the best examples are found in Southeast Asia. Even Malaysia, which has been saddled with one-party rule for over 50 years, has recently shown political maturity in electing an opposition coalition to power in five key states built on the cooperation of an avowedly Islamic party, a secular Chinese-based party, and the multiracial justice party. Never before has such a diverse political coalition existed in Malaysia's opposition. Whilst there are differences that need to be ironed out, the three parties have found common cause and reason to hold hands in the pursuit of good governance and the rule of law. 
Now, if the world is to wage a war on the level of ideas, I would suggest that its target be authoritarianism and dictatorship. And there should be a concerted effort to address the issues of poverty and marginalization, which are most often the root cause of violence and extremism. Promoting democracy, as was the popular phrase used in the past administration in the United States, is just not holding elections. Elections are important, no doubt. But if we look at them in isolation from the broader framework of democracy, we would certainly miss the point. In fact, we see elections taking place quite regularly in countries which are anything but democratic because the institutional framework is fragile. The fragility of some democracies, including in Southeast Asia, in the Philippines, and to an extent in Thailand. And because we are not able to build effective institutions of governance and the rule of law. The judiciary, for example, is often compromised with judges singing the tune of their political masters. I'm fully aware of that fact. Joining the chorus is the mainstream media that operates as a mouthpiece of a for-government propaganda. It is virtually impossible for diverse political views to thrive in an environment where power is monopolized by the ruling clique. And without a vibrant opposition and a plurality of perspectives, the possibility of a change in the ruling party is unlikely, and democracy as we know it would wither and die. I fail to accept the notion that political stability can only be achieved by sacrificing freedom and democracy. Nor do I believe that we achieve a truly vibrant economy that empowers people and allocates uh, resources effectively. Amatya Sen's uh, thesis on democracy and development states, political rights, including freedom of expression and discussion, are not only pivotal in inducing social responses to economic needs, they are also central to the conceptualization of economic needs themselves. Now, in my travel across uh, and around the Muslim world in recent years, recent years because I was resting in the last previous six years, but I told Dean Henry those were great years too because you are in solitary, solitary confinement. What do you do? You read. So not many uh, friends, including those in academia, have that privilege of um, <laughs> reading all the classical texts uh, from Anna Akhmatova of, of Russia to Boris Pasternak and Tolstoy and of course Shakespeare. And reading Shakespeare four and a half times, the entire works. That's why I'm invited here. <laughs> now, but, but the attainment of national liberation, liberation led to a period of short-lived euphoria, but high hopes were quickly replaced with a sense of great betrayal. Governments founded on the principles of freedom and justice were usurped by tyrants, dictators, and despots who have held power for decades and continue to rob, plunder, and repress with impunity. The battle cries of freedom fighters have been muffled not only by authoritarian governments, but it's a very important critical point here, the complicity of many countries in the West in preferring stability over reform and political change. On top of that, the bellicose language of the previous administration here signaled that security and the fight against terrorism were the only grounds on which engagement between America and the Muslim world could proceed. That's in the past. This gave even more leeway, unfortunately, to, these, to those same governments to arrest and detain political dissidents on the basis that they, present, that they presented a threat to national security. 
Perhaps now with the current administration, the tide is turning. Cowboy-style diplom diplomacy has, been give has given way to a more measured tone. And the new president has demonstrated a clear understanding of the nuances of Muslim civilization. Now, our commitment to democracy and our pursuit of freedom and justice is no more or in no mere theoretical construct. We are in the trenches, so to speak, fighting for those fundamental rights which we believe are universal and inalienable. The dark, dark nights spent by political prisoners jailed without trial haunt us as much as the billions of dollars hemorrhaged from state coffers into the pockets of cronies. Well, there is, there is of course, a great deal of hope in the, in the advances made in Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, and Turkey. But I know that the road ahead in most other countries remains long and the task others. But we remain committed and I believe and I am personally an incorrigible optimist that we will succeed. Thank you. I guess I'd like to push this question of Islam and democracy uh, one or two steps further. You made, I think, a very eloquent case for the fact that the inherent tenets of Islam are quite compatible with both human dignity and democracy. But of course, the reality often is that the people who embrace a religion frequently can distort its original goals in pursuit of their own efforts at power and the like. And it seems to me that's happened not only in the Muslim world, but of course we see it in much of the Western world and many occasions since the Crusades. So <clears throat> I guess I would like to hear your thoughts on how you would envision if and when your coalition comes to power balancing off the demands for respect for the Muslim religion, plus the fact that Malaysia is in fact a multi-ethnic and multi-religious society with the need to govern and to govern democratically. That's never an easy process, but I guess what I'm really asking is how you would balance those competing forces. Thank you. The, uh, that is why I, I believe the thrust of our program and agenda, the clamor for reform, the issues, the central issues, the fundamental issues must be clearly explained and well articulated. Muslims must understand that um, in a multiracial, multireligious country, they must join together to respect and, com and, and commit themselves to respect the fundamental guarantees in the Constitution. The issues, uh, the, the points that I raise on the issue of uh, freedom of conscience, expression, uh, sanctity of life and property, and human dignity, are uh, clearly guaranteed in the Constitution. They, this has a bearing. A Muslim ask, what about the Sharia? then my answer, my reply would be that the higher objectives of the Sharia make it abundantly clear. I was in Pakistan two years back. At the time of this crisis or this, the controversy regarding the cartoon, the Danish cartoon, I was asked about the reaction of Pakistanis. So I said, to me, any attempt 
to insult religious uh, beliefs or prophets are despicable. But how do you deal with these issues? You reply, you engage, you counter these arguments, this sort of uh, new medieval thinking of uh, an anti or Islamophobia. But you can't go and uh, attack them. What happened in Pakistan is massive rioting ending with destruction of life and property. Now, this runs contrary to the higher objectives of the Sharia. You say you do it because you're Islamic core, but then your action runs contrary to the spirit of the Sharia. So when I was, uh, that was in Karachi, by the time I was, uh, uh, arrived in uh, Islamabad, a group of uh, Islamic scholars and Islamic activists then uh, asked for a meeting and challenged me on that, uh, for uh, making that statement. My retort was clear. I do not accept these um, allegations or, or any attempt to denigrate any prophet or any religious entity. But you must allow um, the freedom to express. I will disagree totally. But you cannot, on your own volition, go and destroy the property. So I think that principle has relevance to your question, that this must be made very clear. Yes, in Malaysia, vast majority Muslims, yes, 55% are Muslims. And in the constitution, Islam is the religion of the federation. But you cannot use the Islam to compel others to accept, to have laws to compel others to accept. And that's first. Secondly, you must not allow this uh, majority uh, position to deny the rights of the minorities. Like what happened by the previous administration in Malaysia, and then the present administration in Malaysia. What did they do? They demolished a Hindu temple, a hundred-year-old Hindu temple, because Hindus, Indian Hindus happen to be the minority in Malaysia. But there is a difference. The entire discourse has changed. Instead of the Hindus protesting, the Hindus together with the Buddhists and the Muslims and Muslim leaders then stood and defended the rights of the Hindus. So this is, to me, a major uh, change in the political landscape in Malaysia and that will stay with the uh, coalition of the People's Alliance that we are involved in now. Thank you very much. We, we had several questions that were somewhat uh, autobiographical in, in character, and one of the more interesting ones, uh, essentially, that, that I would pose out of two questions. You spent a long time in UMNO, uh, broke with the party, and then spent a considerable period of time in uh, prison in solitary confinement. And one of the questioners asked very explicitly, what were the political lessons that you took from your time in prison? Was there anything that you concluded after your imprisonment that was different from what you had believed politically before you went to prison? <clears throat> this uh, reminds me of um, the dialogue of uh, King Lear and Cordelia. And then, uh, in the Hindu epic of uh, Ramayana Bhagavad Gita, the uh, dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, um, of course you grow wiser. You are, uh, you are dumped into the dungeon in prison, solitary confinement, and uh, prior to that you were assaulted to near death uh, by the chief the number one police officer in the country. So they say, what do you learn from that process? If it ever I have a chance to appoint the number one police chief, I wouldn't appoint a very tough person. <laughs> in case he beats you up, <laughs> you suffer immensely. So, but, but on a serious note, um, yes, I was uh, involved with the ruling party for a long time. Uh, I was deputy and even acting prime minister for a period. I tried to introduce uh, tough legislation against uh, corruption, um, engage uh, the non-Muslims, 
Muslim Christian dialogues and uh, conducted a major conference on Islam and Confucianism um, and then promote this whole series of discussions on Asian Renaissance from Jose Rizal to Rabbi Nanath Tagore to Muhammad Iqbal, for example. I mean, the whole intention is, of course, to try and transform the thinking of uh, Malaysians um, so that Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians can see the higher ideal and uh, the principles they would like to project for Malaysia. Uh, but, of course, I can't, in all honesty, absorb myself from all the excesses of the ruling establishment. I concede, and I made it, made it known to the Malaysians that, yes, I tried to undertake reform from within. I did whatever I could, and I failed. And I was badly assaulted and imprisoned. What did you learn in prison? Of course, you, you grow older, slightly, not too old. And you grow wiser. You read, you empathize with the people. You, you have the experience of meeting presidents and dine with kings and sultans when you empower. And uh, in the dungeon and prison cells, uh, food was thrown to you like um, they treat uh, animals or slaves. Um, you, were, you were assaulted to near death. But you are not given, you are deprived of basic uh, medical treatment um, for weeks, for months. So it can either teach you or imbibe the feeling of uh, bitterness and anger and rage. Yes, I was. Slightly, or the initial period was a bit angry and rage. I have difficulty understanding why should this happen to me. But then you tend to philosophize after serious meditation and rereading Shakespeare from the prism of prison cell. Amazing, just, uh, I will tell you this short note. After I was released, when I was at Oxford, the conference of, um, lit uh, they, they call it uh, English Literature Conference, or all these English literature professors, all over the world, they organized a conference Shakespeare. And they wrote to me, asking me to give a keynote address. So I wrote back, in all humility. Humility is a very key word, and you're quoting T.S. Eliot. The only wisdom one can hope to acquire is humility. Humility is endless. You want to start learning to quote, then you go to prison. <laughs> now, uh, so I wrote back to them, I said, in all humility, I'm not I'm certainly underqualified to speak to all these professors of English literature. So they wrote back. They said, we want to hear from you about how you see uh, and, and um, you, if you can tell us from your own experience, reading and understanding and appreciating the genius Shakespeare from the prism of prison cell. So that's what precisely I did, better than all the professors of English literature. But they, didn't have, they did not have that experience. So looking at uh, Lady Macbeth from the cell, to Cordelia from the cell, to Othello, is different. And uh, it's an enriching experience. But you tend then to also um, look beyond uh, the past I mean, and move on with your life. Uh, you say, okay, the day I was released, I came up with a public statement. All the excesses committed by, the, by the, those rogues are now forgiven. No malice towards them. We have to move on. What is our agenda? Now, I understand the value of freedom better than many of my friends, my colleagues outside. I've been talking about freedom and justice for decades. But staying six years surviving 
in solitary confinement, you value freedom. You will not compromise and, and, and sacrifice freedom and, and rationalize with any other means. I detest those who would sacrifice freedom or repress or commit any unjust act against any individual. Yes, I was beaten. I was this famous black eye for to, uh, covered all the international media. But thousands and hundreds and thousands of others uh, were given not only the same, but some even worse fate than me. Not heard of, not known. No. Their welfare must be protected, must be defended. That is why you remember the, uh, the Abu Ghraib incident um, perpetrated by some members of the U.S. Army against um, the detainees in Iraq. You see, the entire Arab and Muslim international media condemned, and I do. I think it is, it is really not only unfortunate, but even something we must condemn, condemn unreservedly because of the atrocities committed. But we must learn one basic principle. We must remain consistent. If you condemn the atrocities committed or perpetrated by the, some U.S. personnel, why do you cover, cover up the stench in your own backyard? Because the treatment of Muslims, Muslim prisoners or in Muslim countries are sometimes worse than what you see in Abu Ghraib. What did I learn? You must present a consistent moral position on these issues. East or West, America or Iran, Muslim or Christian, justice is justice. It's not due to color or nationality. That much I have learned, I have committed and dedicated myself to change and I continue to appeal to my friends, beginning in Malaysia, to exercise their right and demand and continue to clamor for change, for the betterment of Malaysian society. Thank you. We had a number of questions on the ethnicity in uh, Malaysia and how, if you were governing, you might deal with this. But one of the central questions, of course, is the pro-Malay or Bumiputra policy, which provides a kind of affirmative action for Malays, presumably to some extent at the expense of the Indian or Chinese populations. Uh, so that's one question. How do you deal with the multi-ethnicity of Malaysia if you are in a position of governance and power in a way that both respects majority but also minority rights? And linked to this, I think, is a second question which was that as education minister, uh, you were partly in charge of eliminating English as the level uh, for the tertiary education uh, in universities in Malaysia. And many would argue that an English education would provide a national unification across those different ethnic groups and or would also enhance the value of Malaysian education in the long term. So I think uh, several people would be interested in hearing your plans for dealing with a multi-ethnic Malaysia in a way that is democratic. How would that affect now special privileges for the Malay minority, majority? And is a return to English instruction at the tertiary level something that might be a step in the direction you'd like to see? Thank you. There are two issues. Firstly, the economic. Now, we have crafted the Malaysian economic agenda. Uh, Malaysia in the 90s was a star in Southeast Asia. Market capitalization, number one. Foreign direct investments, we were the most attractive in the region. Competitiveness, number two, after Singapore, etc. I can list. Now, you compare most of this. We have lost to Indonesia in terms of market cap uh, uh, to Singapore in terms of market capitalization, investments to, to Indonesia, to Vietnam. Of course, 
Malaysian leaders who continue to say, yes, we are better than Burma. I say, yes, I agree with you. Not only Burma, Somalia, Chad, Senegal, Zimbabwe, we are all better than that. But I say, what is the central point? Our competitiveness must be compared to the countries on the same threshold as we were in the 70s or early 80s. Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia. In 1980, somewhat same threshold. Now, these three countries have left us far ahead. They were far ahead compared to us. Well, what went wrong? Absolute, obsolete economic policies that have resulted in the lack of, in the loss of competitiveness. So if the issue is competitiveness, we have to liberalize. Market economy must operate. We must uh, ensure that Malaysia becomes an attractive destination for foreign investments. But this does not mean that um, I'm not as concerned with the issue of distributive justice or affirmative action. I believe in affirmative action and the principle of distributive justice. But you must ensure that the economy must, be, must grow. Malaysia is a trading country. Now that we have lost that, one of the reasons is, of course, due to the new economic policy, affirmative action based on race. What is the issue? If the issue is poverty, then you must tackle poverty, transcending racial barriers. The vast majority are the Malays and the rural indigenous population. But there are pockets of poverty among the Chinese. There are poverty among the Indian community in the estate sector. Why can't we tackle? After all, it's half a century after independence. We can't treat our Malaysian citizens in different categories based on race. Now, the ruling party now campaigned. I was attacked in 98 as pro-America and pro-Jew. Now, pro-Chinese, which is not as bad as pro-Jew among the Muslims. Um, so, I, I mean, my um, way of uh, countering this is not to be apologetic. I said, no, as far as we are concerned, our position is very clear. We must remain friends. Christians or Buddhists or Hindus or Jews. That's a problem. So the economic program, the Malaysian economic agenda must be focused on bringing up Malaysia and bring back its competitiveness. That's number one. Secondly, the obsolete racial, racial policy of the new economic policy must be discarded. And they say, you used to support in the 70s. Yes, I do not deny. Our intention at that time was to ensure that those poor Malays, as compared to more industrious business um, Chinese, must be given additional support. Yes, we give. But our thinking at that time, microcredit for the poor, scholarship for poor students to enter the universities. Now... What's happening is billions of dollars of free shares, of contracts, procurement policy awarded to the so-called Malays who happen to be cronies and family members of the ruling clique. Billions of dollars squandered in the name of the new economic policy and Malay rights. And this we have to reject. The policy, procurement policy must be very transparent. How do you then continue in this days and age? Buy two submarines from France, 400 million commission. Buy Sukhoi jets from Russia, 500 million ringgit commission. Now, when we ask, they say commission is permissible. Corruption is illegal. So the rich take commission, the poor corruption. It's the same bloody nonsense you're committing.
That is why I think we must be firm in dealing this, with these issues. So, uh, it's all said, easy, easily said, and easier said than done, but then in, uh, in the campaign in Malaysia, we'll have to deal with this problem because the Malays, particularly the, the poorer uh, Malays in the rural sector, do not have, still feel rather insecure. So we will have to go back to them in the absence of a free media. Now, I have told, I told the, uh, Dean Henry just now that um, uh, I can speak here at Berkeley and then I will address size and Georgetown next week, but I can't enter any local university. Not, not a matter of addressing them. I can't even enter physically most of these universities. That is a sort of uh, uh, repressive uh, measure uh, in place in the country. Not a word in the national media, never interviewed by the local television network. So we will have to um, continue our effort in trying to get the Mal uh, Malays, Chinese, Indians to understand this new policy. And this is a commitment of uh, the uh, opposition coalition and uh, this has been the policy in the original five states that we won, five provinces that is under the control of the coalition. And now, the second question relates to the policy on, lang on language. Let me clarify this. As far as I'm concerned, our decision has been that the national language is the Malay Malaysian language. It's important that the level of proficiency of the Malaysian language is uh, satisfactory. Now, I was Minister of Education long after the policy to implement Malay language in the universities. I became Minister of Education in 87. The decision to um, continue with that program in the lay language in the universities was in 1971. First implemented in 1973, I became Minister of Education in 1987. That's just to correct. But do I agree with that policy? Yes, I agree. But must it be done at the expense of English? No. Universities, particularly in countries like Malaysia, must be bilingual. Students either can, can opt for uh, English or Malay, the, the main two languages. If they offer Bahasa Malaysia, the Malaysian language, they must have not only satisfactory, but a, a, a very good level of proficiency in the English language. And this is, must be a requirement. It's not a zero-sum game. You should do both. And I think what we need to do now is a policy to promote an effective and use of the uh, English language. But the language controversy also affects the uh, demands by the Chinese community initially and the Indians to um, support the teaching of Chinese and Tamil. My answer is quite clear on this, that Chinese is no longer a language of the ethnic Chinese in Malaysia. Chinese has now become a very important regional language. So we need to promote it, not only among the Chinese population, but Malaysians at large, whoever want to master the language. And I think with this attitude, without sacrificing the national language or the importance of English, is being promoted and projected. And I think the more Malaysians understand, then we don't have this rancorous exchange over language and religion and whether English is important or Bahasa Malaysia is important. Thank you. Uh, there are many, many more questions here, but I realize time is short, so let me close with a final question, and that would be, on your way to Washington, what are you thinking that you believe the Obama administration should be doing to improve relations with Malaysia? And then in keeping with your formulation, when you become Prime Minister, what will you be doing to improve relations with the United States? Now, I've been very consistent on this point, that um, we must uh, 
uh, in order for Malaysia or ASEAN to succeed, we must continue to have uh, excellent bilateral and multilateral relations with the United States, with the uh, Europe, European Union, with China and the rest of India and the rest of Asia. This, um, this is fundamental as a trading nation. And uh, with the Obama administration uh, wanting to engage with Africa, with the Muslim world, and um, departing from that sort of a rancorous uh, diatribe against uh, countries, uh, axes of evil, etc., etc., I think it's a brilliant move and an excellent opportunity for us to respond. When Obama gave the speech in um, Cairo, I happened to be in, in London. I was fortunate because all the media networks, CNN, BBC, uh, Bloomberg, and TV24, France, and Al Jazeera, uh, sought my comments. And of course, I welcomed that. Uh, one of the, I took to me, most reassuring, soothing to the Muslim generally. Uh, but, and I said, uh, firstly, it was the withdrawal from Iraq, and at least some uh, concern showed on the plight of the Palestinians whilst defending the right of Israel to exist as a state. Uh, but I said, I cannot agree on this continued occupation of Afghanistan that I express my strong views against. And hopefully, I have the opportunity next week in my discussions with uh, Richard Holbrook to express my viewpoint as a village boy from Malaysia. Um, of course, uh, as a friend, I hope he could uh, consider. Uh, but back to the issue of uh, Malaysia-United States uh, relations, it is critical because United States remain the most, one of the most or second most important trading nation to Malaysia. And um, but uh, I don't believe the relationship should be only in terms of economic or trade. The United States must continue to play its critical role as a voice of conscience defending freedom and human rights. Sometimes we worry a bit when um, President Obama seemed to be a bit soft on the issue of uh, freedom on human rights. I mean, his speeches have been reassuring, it's clearly. Inaugural speech, Cairo speech, you know, we, we listen, we are very attentive. Unlike the, I, mean, I have never been that attentive to listening to any of the President Bush's speeches, but then um, there's, of course, this change. So I think it is, it is uh, you know, something that we welcome. But uh, it is also important that, you know, United States remain this voice of conscience. You know, I, I want to relate these things because many Americans think, well, you know, Muslims are difficult, they disagree, um, they hate us. You would know, look at the Pew uh, research uh, and quite a number of other researchers um, on the state of the Muslim mind, particularly in the contentious region in the Middle East. You ask them, whom do you hate most? They say Bush. And I can understand, of course. But then they say, well, if you are given an opportunity to leave your country and go to somewhere, uh, some other countries, which country do you prefer? Number one, United States of America. You see? So is there, if this sort of answer means you dislike certain policies of leaders, but you don't dislike the country or the people. I mean, and similarly, exp similar expressions in, in, in Indonesia or Malaysia. And, um, Indonesians are generally at that time quite critical of, of uh, United States, particularly you know, after 9-11, because some of the you know, statements and uh, foreign policy uh, issues. But during the tsunami, I remember I was in Kuala Lumpur. The American forces, military forces, were the most, one of the most effective 
and fastest. Reaching Aceh and help, you know, without any condition. They just went in and helped. And you know, in a matter of two weeks when there was this uh, random survey, they saw this change of perception from 30% or so a bit positive towards America and changed to about 75 to 80% of Achenese and Indonesians viewing very positively the role the United States played. And I think this is, these are important signs that people are not inherently against anybody. It is uh, this condescending, this semblance of arrogance, this hectoring that people have difficulty in accepting. So exchange is important, trade is important, and the contribution of America after America is still uh, the most important power on earth. And um, this, um, to me, for Malaysia, is a small country, it's a developing, uh, emerging economy. We would certainly value not only the friendship, and I have, uh, at the personal level, I must say, that uh, benefited immensely. Some of the friends have been very, very loyal friends. Uh, when I was in power, when I was out, when all the big guys disappear, but some known, notable Americans, knowing that they will not gain anything, I was just down and out. No possibility of a comeback. Those years, dark years from 99, 2000, 2001. There were great American personalities who stood up and defended. And uh, Madeleine Albright, for example, went to and met Aziza, my wife, and my kids, and said, look, we know what your father did. We will do whatever it takes to defend his rights. You know? And this, um, to Aziza and the children, means so much. Although we know, we can expect more. We are not suggesting America go to war in order to free Anwar. You know? But these are you know, statements, a voice of conscience that's so valuable. Like what we are expressing for Aung San Suu Kyi. I do think a statement this evening, tonight, would immediately bring to her a release. But these are voice of conscience who be, among us who believe in freedom and democracy that's very important to the world. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.